بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر ویئرز ویلکم ٹو دس سیشن آف آر اسلام اسٹڈی سرکل دا قرآنک ورس دیٹ وی گن اسٹڈی ٹوڈے از فرام سورہ صف دا ورسز آر ان فیکٹ دے آر مور دین ون دا فرسٹ از ٹین ٹو فورٹین دا ٹیکسٹ آف دیز ورسز ریڈ یا ایوہ الزین آمن حل ادلکم علا تجارت تنجی کم من عذاب علیم تؤمنون بالله ورسوله وتجاهدون في سبيل الله بأموالكم وأنفسكم ذلك خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون يغفر لكم ذنوبكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن ذلك الفوز العظيم وأخرى تحبونها نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله Believers, shall I guide you to a deal that will save you from a grievous torment? Profess faith in God and His Messenger and fight for God's cause with your wealth and persons. This would be better for you if you understand. As a result, God will forgive your sins and admit you to gardens below which streams flow. He will lodge you in splendid abodes in eternal kingdoms, in eternal gardens. This is great success. And He will also grant what you desire. help from God and a victory near at hand. And O Prophet, give these glad tidings to the faithful. Believers, be God's helpers the way Jesus, son of Mary, said to his disciples, Who will be my helper in the cause of God? The disciples replied, We are God's helpers. We have to uh, first of all understand that uh, As far as the requirements of faith and conser- are concerned, uh, they have to be divided into two broad categories. So one of them uh, are the requirements which are needed all the time. So they are these consistent requirements. And of course, uh, they, they include uh, professing faith in all those entities in which faith has to be pre- professed and then doing righteous deeds and uh, urging one another to do what is right and uh, trying to forbid one another to do what is wrong. So these are the permanent requirements of faith. But besides these permanent requirements of faith, there are also certain contingent requirements of faith which arise as and when needed. And one of them is to support the cause of religion. And as you can see from these verses of Surah Saf, uh, it tells you that when a person is actually uh, in covenant with God, it is as if he has uh, uh, entered into this pledge that if he... fights for the cause of God through his wealth and through his persons, the Almighty will uh, mightily reward him, uh, abundantly reward him. And then uh, the example of Jesus is actually given right at the end. It is said that when Jesus needed the help of his disciples, he said that who is going to be my helpers in the cause of God and all his helpers and all his disciples actually said, yes, we are uh, your helpers. And uh, the word Ansar actually is exactly from this, uh, this root uh, as has been used for Jesus' disciples. And uh, you can clearly see that as far as uh, the Ansar of Medina are concerned, they are also regarded to be the Ansar precisely for this reason, because they became helpers of this new religion in the land of Medina. So the important point that we need to understand here today is that uh, one of the uh, very contingent requirements of faith is that whenever your religion needs your support in any way, it could be different in different societies. This need and requirement could be different in the same country in different societies. It could be different in different periods of time in different societies. But the fact is that just as your faith requires that you profess faith in certain entities and do righteous deeds, one of these contingent requirements is that you support the cause of religion. You have to support the cause of, of religion. You have to come forward and see what exactly is the need of the hour uh, vis-a-vis religion. So at times it is just the construction of a mosque, which perhaps would be the need of the hour, where, where areas and localities where even this is not existing, maybe in areas where 
uh, Muslims have just traveled. And then there could be the need of some literature in which uh, people need to be educated. Even it could be the publishing of uh, lit this literature, including the Qurans. And then it could be education for the cause of religion. It could be research for the cause of religion. It could be dissemination. So it's not something which is, uh, which is uh, like a rule of thumb that every particular society has one, uh, one need for this support. These supports vary from time to time. These supports are different for different categories. These supports have their own import and it is basically a person who has to decide that what exactly is the need or the, for the cause of religion. And remember, it's not always wealth which one has to expend uh, regarding such needs. It could be your own time. It could be your own skill. It could be many other things that you can offer in support. So what we have to understand is that as far as uh, offering our support is concerned, this is a contingent requirement of faith. It arises as and when needed. Uh, it arises uh, almost in every society today because of the fact that we find Islam or its followers in a shape in which this promotion and this patronage of religion is needed. Uh, state patronage is not exist, does not exist in every society. For example, we do have Muslim countries like, for example, Saudi Arabia or Malaysia in which there, there is state patronage, but there are a lot of countries, especially people living in non-Muslim countries in which supporting the cause of their religion is a requirement of their faith or has become a requirement of their faith. And remember that this support for the cause of religion has to be peaceful at all costs. It does not require any sort of militancy. In fact, it has no link to any militancy. Uh, and as far as uh, the support is concerned, as I said, it, is, it varies from person to person, but it's a question of realizing this. You see, it's not just praying in the mosque and uh, fasting and doing hajj or doing charity, doing good deeds and uh, uh, practicing righteousness that is sufficient. This is, a, this is a very important aspect which many of us have forgotten. It's, it can be rightly termed as a forgotten requirement of faith that whenever faith needs us, of course, God could have done on his own uh, f as far as dissemination is concerned, as far as it, the patronage religion is concerned, he has actually left it to us to test us. So something which belongs to God, something which he could have easily done uh, for himself, he has actually left it to us so as to see whether we do our bit or not. And because of the fact that uh, many a time we do not realize that this is something of paramount importance, this is something that is uh, that we have to always analyze and do something for its cause that, uh, uh, that at times uh, misses our uh, own focus and attention, that this verse has calls us to attention. Remember, this is not just the case with Muhammad wasallam. As you can see, Jesus and before him, other Israelite prophets and of course even before him, other prophets, all they call people towards faith and because faith, its patronage, its dissemination, its education is through human hands. So therefore, God wants us to use our own abilities, our own capacities for this very purpose. And this, of course, is one of the trials of religion as well. So in today's times, we need to ask ourselves this question, that besides doing other and uh, uh, discharging other responsibilities of faith, are we also discharging this very important, this all-important responsibility of supporting the cause of religion. Are we involved in some, some activity which, according to our own assessment, is something that can be called supporting the cause of religion? And in the terms of the Quran, it is, it is called Nusrat. Nusrat in Arabic, of course, refers to help. And helping the cause of religion, doing something for the cause of religion, uh, whatever we understand, is some, uh, something which needs, our, uh, needs the support of religion is incumbent upon us and we must not lose sight of it and uh, because in current times we have almost lost sight of it and we think that uh, religion, uh, the requirements of religion are few cut out requirements and uh, we often forget that one of these very important requirements is to support uh, the cause of religion, to do what we can and uh, it's like, a, like I like a sense of honor that we have for religion. 
uh, if religion is something that needs our support and we are there and we don't realize that we are doing something, then of course this is something which would tell very badly on us. It's like showing uh, ourselves to be people who don't have the honor and respect which our own faith deserves. And uh, thus it's very important that we remember this message, this all important message of the Quran. Next viewers, we go on to the Hadith part of our study circle. Uh, the Hadith that we are going to study today has been selected from the Al Jami al Sahih of uh, Imam Muslim, and uh, its words are it's supported by Abu Huraira. An Abi Huraira ta anna Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam qal iza nazara ahadukum ila man fudil alayhi fil mali wal khalq fal yanzur ila man huwa asfala minhu min man fudil alayhi. Again, it's a beautiful piece of psychological advice that anyone of us uh, would do well uh, to actually uh, gauge. So it says, Abu Huraira reported that God's messenger uh, وسلم, said, When any one of you sees someone who is blessed with more wealth and better physique, he should also see him who has lesser wealth and lesser physique. So as you can clearly see, viewers, that uh, prophets of God, they are master psychologists as well. Uh, they not only guide people in their religious affairs, they also guide people in various conducts and various activities of life. And one of them is that we often feel deprivation. We feel this sense of deprivation when we see people who are better off than us, maybe people who are more wealthier, maybe people who are more attractive, more, uh, more endowed in, in their physique. So, Look what the Prophet of God has told us. He says, okay, there are people who might be wealthier than you, and there are people who might, be, who might have a better physique. Uh, but if this is the case, then look at people who are less wealthier than you, who are less attractive in physique than you. And then you realize that how, how blessed you have been. And uh, if, if he has uh, taken away something from you, then there are thousands of people who are lesser uh, even in what you have as compared to them. So the important point here is to always count our blessings. Human nature is such that if we have a thousand blessings and we have just a couple of deprivations, our minds tend to focus on that, on those couple of deprivations. It is here that we are actually uh, urged by the, prophet, the Prophet's personality that we have to show this positive attitude. We have to always count our blessings. We have to realize that God has drenched us with his favors and his blessings. It's just a matter of counting them. I often uh, bring this subject up and talk to people that look at your eyes. Imagine yourself being blind. If you get blind and you, you had the fortune of being a person who had eyesight, uh, look what you would feel like. Your world would go, grow dark and all your uh, life's charms would perhaps come to nothing. And if you have to see how people who are deprived of this eyesight, even, even in this position, they thank God, they, you, you find them chatting and, and beaming and uh, uh, joking with one another and being happy. So it's, it's an object lesson for us that deprivation is something that all of us have in some form or another. It's just a question of realizing what we have instead of brooding on what we don't have. And this, of course, is also a form of test from the Almighty. He wants to check, he wants to test us that when we, whenever we are in good circumstances, whenever we, are, whenever we are blessed with His favors, of course, we, we do thank God. We are very happy. But God wants to check us that when He deprives us of some favors, when He takes away some of, our, some of His blessings, how do we behave? He wants to test our mettle. And it is in, this circumst in these circumstances that the Prophet has given this beautiful guidance that always look at people who are less blessed than you and you will realize that how God has blessed you. And as I said, starting from your eyes, from your own physical body, a normal physical body which is not handicapped is such a huge gift of God if we just realize and look at people who are disabled, look at people who are handicapped, look at people who are sick. So it's, 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 it, it simply cannot be gauged and we have to keep reminding ourselves. You see, human, one of the uh, shortcomings of every human being is that we tend to forget. We forget every second moment that we have so much 
we have so much uh, that we do just lose sight of that what we have and uh, always complain on what we don't have. So it's just a question of always focusing ourselves on the positivities of life and emit this po positive energy and always be happy. I once read some uh, a very interesting quote on, on the Facebook which said that if you're not happy, it's your own fault. And I realized that it's absolutely true because the remote of happiness is with us and the best way to be happy is to make other people happy. If we are able to make other people happy, the amount of happiness it can bring to us is simply unmatched. I'm sure all of you who have brought smiles and happiness to other people, the amount of uh, joy that it brings to the person who do this, to the people who do this, is, is, is simply uh, cannot be stated in words. So uh, we have to take control of our lives. We have to be people who always thank God for what we have and always show this positive. If we are positive, we will radiate positive rays in our society. Our own, society, our own family, our own community, our own offices and schools and places that we go, they will resonate this positivity and they will transfer this legacy of gratitude. And of course, gratitude is also one of the best therapies and antidotes to all sorts of low feelings and all sorts of depression that comes our way. May God guide us in this regard and may we always count our blessings and whenever we see someone who is more blessed uh, than us, we also have this courage to look at people who are less blessed than us and then realize that how we are better off than so many people in the world. Uh, we now go to the third part of our study circle and this is the uh, Bible verse of the day. Uh, this is uh, chapter number 12 verse 18 of the book of Proverbs which is attributed to the prophet Solomon. It says, uh, there are some whose uncontrolled talk is like the wounds of a sword, but the tongue of the wise makes one well again. So again, a very, very appropriate piece of advice. As we always say uh, that the tongue, that the wounds of the sword are less deeper than the wounds of the tongue or vice versa. The wounds inflicted by the tongue, they are much deeper they are much more pervasive, they, much, they cause much more agony than the wounds caused by the sword because they stay with you. The wounds of the sword, they get healed, but the wounds which have been inflicted by the tongues of other people, they stay with us and they make us miserable. So we are advised that we must control our tongue. Look what the Prophet Solomon says, that there are some whose uncontrolled talk is like the wound of a sword. So just as the sword caches through your skin and a, a, a stream of blood just bursts out in a very similar way. When we speak and we speak in an uncontrollable way, we actually inflict such harm on our addresses and the people who are in front of us that we simply cannot imagine. And the best way in fact to imagine this is that whenever we are at the receiving end, whenever we are the people who are actually being critiqued or we are at the receiving end of harsh language. So one of the biggest things that we can do is to control our tongue, is to tame our tongue as I say. It's like a monster. It's like something which is, which is beyond at times uh, control but we have to control our tongue because it can make and break relationships. It can cause a, a, a irreparable damage. So if we are able to control our tongues if we are able to put a guard on our tongues and, and as the wise say that always think before we speak and delay the reaction. You see what causes these wounds of the tongue is that we show immediate reaction and this is something that we need to control. We must delay our reaction because the adrenaline pumps in with us whenever we, we get angry. It makes us uh, very nasty towards other individuals and if we just delay our reaction even by a couple of maybe seconds or even moments, we would be in a better shape to respond. At times we respond rashly. At times we respond in a manner in which we misunderstand the other person and instead of realizing that we, we have understood someone wrongly and reacted even more wrongly, uh, we have to show patience. And this strength of character actually is here that it is acquired. The strength of the character is directly proportional 
to the control that we can exercise. Remember, the word for this self-control in religion is taskia. Taskia means that you have to purify your soul. You have to control your desires. You have to control yourself. You have to be self-disciplined. You must not trespass the bounds. And taqwa, what taqwa, what does taqwa mean? You must not cross the bounds, certain limits which are the limits of God. So if we have to be muttaqi, if we have to be pious, if we have to be people who are purified individuals, the first step is to tame our tongue, is to guard our tongue, is to stop before uttering any word, is to analyze that what I am saying, even it, if it might be true, it might have a wrong reaction. People might perceive it wrongly. So even the perception of something is very important. So you have to choose your words. The more wisely you choose your words, the more effective you can be. At times you can ruin your case by wrong words. And if your words are sweet and gentle, even a wrong case can be won. So we can see how important presentation is, how important controlling oneself is. And so uh, with these words, we come on to the last part of our study circle, which is generally a discussion or a small topic that we discuss. And this time we have this thing before us. The topic is, is honesty really the best policy? Well, of course, this is something which is... Uh, always under discussion. This has been always under discussion. And uh, as, as a best policy, this is something that we teach our children, that we have been taught ourselves when we are growing up. And uh, today, this has been called into question because honesty does not always pay. And so if it really is the best policy, then why is it that honesty at times has adverse effects? Why should we be honest? Uh, why should we lose a lot of things because of honesty? So this is, it is here that we actually need our, uh, our scriptures and divine guidance because in the absence of divine guidance, our immediate reaction and our immediate impulsive reaction is that why should we lose something which is materially good for us uh, by being honest, by being truthful, by being moral, by having a high conduct. And it is here that we, are, that we come across this conscience that we have human conscience, something which is placed by the Creator, is there for a reason. It's not there without reason. And the reason that it is placed there is that it tells us that there is someone inside you which distinguishes right from wrong, to whom honesty is still the best policy, to whom dishonesty is the most evil thing, even if it repays you, and even if honesty does not repay you, because of the fact that what is right and what is wrong is something which cannot be placed without a purpose in our own existence. And therefore, we need to understand that even if honesty does not repay at times, if it has actually an adverse or a counter uh, result, even then the existence of God, the belief in God and the belief in hereafter actually reinforces us and tells us that come what may, we have to be honest. Even if we lose in this world, we, have, we will gain plenty in the next. And because for believers, the next world is the real world. Any temporary loss because of the sake of righteousness is something that we have to bear. And there's nothing, there's no one more who has uh, spoken more for the sake of persecution and still being uh, uh, righteous in the face of persecution than Jesus himself. And if we study the New Testament, especially the Sermon on the Mount, we realize that to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness and still smile, still have the guts and courage to stand in this world and st to still uphold the flag of honesty. It shows a lot of strength of character. It shows that honesty and people who are honest, they have to be lauded. They, have, they are the standard bearers of humanity. They are the salt of this earth. They are the people whom we need to follow because they have written with, the, with their own blood these tales of uprightness, of honesty, of valor, of courage, and they have never given up in the wake of troubles. They have never given up in the wake of adversity. And it's, they still shine out for us as, as sterling examples that they have set. So uh, I would say that uh, any temporary reversal in the face of honesty has to be suffered and borne for the sake of righteousness. And we have to expect our uh, reward from the Almighty. And uh, we have to teach this to our younger generation also that honesty does not always repay you. In fact, being honest might lead you to a lot of uh, 
as to results that we, you would never like. But for the for the cause of God, for the the, the fact that we uh, believe that uh, for the sake of righteousness, this persecution has to be borne, if such is the case in the wake of the hereafter, that we would be rewarded for all these actions. And even this, in this world, this could be the fact in the form of our own generations and our own progeny. And if not here, then in the next world, uh, that we have to gain this respect and transfer this legacy of being honest to the next generation. And so viewers, with these words, we come to an end to this uh, study circle. Uh, I can open your mics now if you have any questions. I can see Mr. Hashim Kazi, uh, your mic is unmuted, your hand is raised. So please go ahead with your question. Hello, Salaam Doctor, uh, can you hear me? Walaikum Salaam. Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Um, not related to topic, it's actually uh, to seek advice uh, for, I'm um, speaking on, on behalf of a mother mm -hmm. uh, who lost her, her child and and uh, what sort of advice and the questions that, uh, are, that are coming from her is, mm -hmm. one, what happens to my kid after one dies, why mm -hmm. isn't is mm -hmm. there much information in religion about the kids who pass away in, uh, uh, as infants? Uh, we talk about people who have done very good deeds, we talk mm -hmm. about people who have done pretty bad deeds, and people mm -hmm. who will be judged, who are put to sleep, but why isn't there much information about the kids mm -hmm. as an, in children, infants? And as a mother uh, who doesn't want to, you know, who doesn't feel motivated, doesn't want to live anymore, wants to join her kid, and um, mm -hmm. basically uh, always get worried whenever, you know, there is a, a thunderstorm or raining that you know my child mm. is uh, suffocating in the grave or what's happening to my mm. child in the grave what advices can be given to a mother so, in this situation so actually first of all uh, you need to tell her that uh, as far as the grave is concerned uh, it is just a repository of the mortal remains of her child as far as the real personality of the child is concerned which feels pain or which feels pleasure it resides safely with the Almighty in the land of Barzakh and it is put to sleep there till the day of judgment. So she need not be frightened on storms or on thunder and lightning because it has no effect whatsoever on the mortal remains. Mortal remains have no feelings, they are just like dead, they are non-organic cells. So the real personality of her child and indeed of every dead human being uh, resides in the area which is called Barzakh by the Quran. We don't know where it is, it is somewhere where God knows, but we know this much from the Quran that souls are put to sleep in that area and they will rise on the day of judgment and uh, as far as little children are concerned, this is of course uh, very common sense. Uh, the reason that she might not find a lot of information regarding this is that uh, the Quran deals with the basic subject that whenever a person is given authority and uh, given this liberty to exercise his freedom, it is then that he or she becomes liable to the Sharia. Because of the fact that a child who has, who's as a, has died as an infant never enters that age in which he or she is liable for the directives of the Sharia. Therefore, the discussion uh, in detail is not done there. Uh, even then, we find in a lot of sayings of the Prophet in our hadith in which uh, we find uh, the Prophet comforting many people. In fact, there is this uh, incident which is mentioned about the Prophet himself. And I think he has set a very... A uh, splendid example of this when, when his own child Ibrahim was dying, he was called and when he came and he saw that he was almost dead, he, he uttered these beautiful words uh, in Arabic which I translated in English and uh, he said that al uh, tadma that my, uh, my eyes are sore with tears, wal tahzan and my heart is very aggrieved, is sorrowful, walakin arzi bi Allah, but I am still happy with God's will. I, I, I'm satisfied with God's will. So on the one hand, he demonstrated that being sad at this uh, incident is not something which is, uh, which is uh, not uh, required, I mean, which is recommended. As human beings, we do get sad. We do get worried. Of course, we cry. Uh, and in fact, at times, crying is something which uh, consoles us. So the prophet showed this, that he's a human being. And in spite of the fact that he is still a very, very revered human being, his human emotions are still there and he cried at the, at, the, at the death of his son. But at the same time, he said that I accept God's decision because there must be something good which 
perhaps I do not know. It is God's will. He wants to test me and I am ready for that. And the third thing that she perhaps needs to be communicated is that, that if we end up uh, in the next world uh, in paradise, then in all probability we'll, we will be united with that infant child because he is or she is going to be in paradise because of the fact that he or she has done nothing which can make her ineligible for paradise. So, if we have done enough good deeds to land us in paradise, we can always console ourselves and tell ourselves that this is just a temporary, uh, we are just away from our child in a very temporary way, it is a temporary period, it is it's a respite which is going to end one day. So, and above all we have to realize that um, God has created this world as a trial and a test for us. At times he tries us by taking away a lot of things that we would like to have and at times he tests and tries us by giving those things to us. So, it is it's, uh, we have to realize that the philosophy of life is that God has created his life as a test for us. We have to think that we are passing through this test and try that we pass through this test in a way that we fly, uh, that we pass in flying colors. Remember that God is someone who is always there for us. It is just a question of having that strong God connection. Because of the fact that we human beings, we earthlings have a weak God connection at times that we lose heart, we get disappointed, we do not realize that the amount of mercy that the Almighty has for us and the amount of love that he has for us is, is unimaginable, it is unfathomable in fact. So, I think that these are some of the words of advice that you can give to that lady who has just lost her child. Okay, thank you. Uh, one small question regarding the verse, mm -hmm. uh, is there any uh, publication which specifically uh, talks about uh, uh, you know the, the mm -hmm. need of religion explains the sort of situations mm -hmm. w w that, uh, so where we have to participate in the cause of religion. Is there any publication on, on so, uh, the So, requi uh, yes, you will find that in uh, one of the chapters of the book Mizan which is available in both languages Urdu and English. In the, in the chapter which is called requisites of faith in which some, some permanent requirements of faith are mentioned and then there are certain contingent requirements of faith which are mentioned. So, among other contingent requirements for example, is the fact to sh that we have to be just come what may, we have to be the standard bearers of justice even if it is against us, we have to be not only just to our own people, but be just to our enemies also. And uh, so, this is this small chapter. Uh, which is uh, just after the requirements of faith, the permanent requirements of faith in which you can study uh, and uh, get to know something more about it. Yeah. Regarding uh, lying, uh, the honesty is the best policy. Um, I do agree that the, uh, by large, mm -hmm. you have to be honest uh, in all matters of life. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there are small petty things where you know, mm -hmm. your kid can get upset or you can, you can have a mm -hmm. argument argument with your wife in that case even you have to be like fully fully honest mathematically. So, so that is uh, an exception. Uh, of course, when we are talking about honesty, we are speaking of certain specific circumstances. But for example, when we are trying to uh, calm a child and we actually make him say that okay, when tomorrow comes I will give you this and this, I just go to sleep now and do not bother me. This is like just the deferring the situation and uh, putting the child to sleep. So, here honesty is not required. Of course, this is not a place in which uh, honesty is something to be uh, uh, to be fastidious about. Honesty has its own venues and we all know when it is required. Uh, such situations of course, these are exceptions and uh, uh, our own conscience tells us that uh, when we are actually telling a joke to a child or telling something uh, just to make him to appease his emotions or to put him to sleep or uh, some of the other situations that are similar. Uh, it, it very well knows, uh, everyone very well knows that this is not uh, dishonesty or cheating. Uh, this is something which is more like deferring something or more like treating a child who might not understand a certain situation and therefore, you have to uh, put him through a certain other, uh, I, I, I would say a certain other uh, approach, put him through a certain approach in which you try to remain as uh, you can close to the truth. But of course, at times uh, when you say certain things merely to put a child to sleep or merely to appease his or her emotions, uh, we perfectly understand that this does not come into uh, telling a lie or being dishonest. Unless of course, unless of course, the child has this 
cognizance that you are speaking this uh, speaking a lie to him so when uh, it's it, it's a case in which children don't realize that uh, you are doing something just to appease their emotions but as soon as they start realizing that you are lying to them or you're doing something which is playing with their emotions as soon as that realization occurs in a child then this technique should not be adopted because in that case you would actually be uh, disseminating the fact that lying to your children in, in a certain way and then either not accepting that lie or maybe uh, making making up some some other excuse to actually uh, depart from their lie so that is something which is of course an exception sure thank you doctor okay so i see no more hands being raised and i uh, so we come to an end to our study circle and hope to see you all again inshallah uh, next week at the same time so until then it is khuda hafiz